excited about this. Uh, we've brought together a number of Awareness to Action Associates, trainers who have studied the Awareness to Action Enneagram with us um, to share with participants the, um, their applications of this system. So uh, my name is Mario Sakura. Uh, with me is uh, Maria Jose Monita. And um, we're going to kick this off with an overview of what the Awareness to Action Enneagram is um, and why it's different from other models. Okay. Um, with, this, uh, with this summit, we have to thank uh, our associate Tamar Zanatti. Uh, first of all, this was his idea, um, and we're very grateful for that, I think. And uh, Tamar's working behind the scenes during this session, and he'll be joining Maria Jose for the second session. Now, uh, you may use the same link to uh, participate in whatever sessions you wish to. Um, and, um, uh, you know, you don't have to attend them all. Also, if you're not able to attend some of them and want to see them, we will be, we will be selling them uh, afterwards at a very reasonable price. I think it's $19 for the whole set. So you can register for that. Uh, one uh, point I want to make here is that we are recording these sessions. So uh, please keep that in mind. Uh, if you do not want to be on uh, camera, uh, then uh, please keep your camera off. Okay, but uh, just should know that this is being recorded. All right, so I think that's the logistics. Uh, Maria Jose, uh, what else should we say? Um, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, there are a couple more logistic um, things to share. One, it's that we encourage you to put your um, the window where the images are, like our images, on the right hand side of your screen. All of our um, slides are aligned to the left. So leaving the um, window with the screens on your right will allow you to see all the content that we have to share uh, more easily. Um, the other thing is that uh, we will be talking today uh, during this session and we um, in invite you to share questions and comments that you may have um, through the chat box. And if you don't know where the chat, book, the chat box is, it's on the panel where it says um, mute or stop video or security. There is something that says uh, chat and you can write your questions there. Tamer will be kindly helping us with that and will um, be sharing with us the questions that you raise. So I think we're ready to um, talk about the session itself. And today we're going to be talking about uh, the awareness to action Enneagram. This is a particular approach to the Enneagram um, that Mario started creating. And along the years, um, others have joined him. And um, we now have a wonderful team working on this uh, approach, using it and developing it uh, continuously. Today we're going to talk about how, it, how what it is and how it's different. And to start with that, I wanted to share how I came about this approach. And after several years of hearing about the Enneagram and then studying it, when I started using it professionally, I realized that there was something missing for me. There was something missing uh, in terms of how to take it to um, the business environment and also what to do with it. And when I met Mario, I think it was 2009 at the IEA board, yes, I, think so. I, I realized that he had a relatively different approach with different terminology and I felt drawn to it. And, but it was another training, right? So I had taken several trainings and I wasn't sure that I, it was worth taking one more, uh, but I did. And um, very quickly I realized that it was the missing piece. It's what I needed. It was <clears throat> um, an approach that allowed me to very easily take this to the corporate environment uh, with simple ways to do that, but also very profound 
insights that help people get it more easily. Um, on top of that, um, this approach has um, very practical ways to um, do something with it, to grow, to use it for uh, personal growth, leadership growth, uh, team growth, and, and that's what I really, really liked about it. And in my experience, this is what people appreciate about the approach. So I'm very excited that we're here, very excited to have a week full of applications of the Enneagram. It's not just about what's your type and how do I find my type. It's about what do I do once I get there? What do I do with my clients um, in order to help them develop the skills that they want to develop and use the Enneagram for that? Yeah. So Mario, why don't you take us through this um, particular approach to the Enneagram and so this will be the foundation for the following session. So this will be a bit more about the theory. We will be laying out the fundamentals of the approach. And in the following sessions, we will be talking about the applications. Great, great. Thank you, Maria Jose. Uh, and I'll just point out to Maria Jose's point, we have a great team and uh, it's a very international team. And uh, through this session, you'll see that. I think there's only uh, three or four of us on the team for whom English is the first language, right? So um, you'll hear all sorts of accents uh, during the session, which I think adds a real richness and robustness to uh, to the work that we do. Uh, the Enneagram is nothing else but a model that helps us understand there are different kinds of people, um, but that we all share common cores, common humanities, and certainly uh, the awareness action team is a reflection of that. So Maria Jose, you've been with me the longest um, uh, working together and uh, I, I really value uh, your, your partnership and, and also your insights into this system and the contributions you've made. So um, let's get started, okay? All right, um, let's look go to the next slide, Maria Jose. Okay. So, so we should start off very briefly talking about what the Enneagram is, right? Um, you know, on the off chance that of the people registered, uh, somebody doesn't know what the Enneagram is. Ennea uh, is Greek for nine, gram for drawing. So the Enneagram itself is a diagram uh, with nine points, nine lines, and uh, nine different kinds of people, nine different personality styles, or what we call strategies, are um, correlated to this diagram. Okay, so the Enneagram has a rich history. Uh, there's a lot of debate about uh, how old it is. There's a lot of mythology about the Enneagram. Uh, from my view, it really got its start in the 1970s uh, through Oscar Echazo and Claudio Naranjo, who really refined these ideas into the system uh, that became the basis of what we know today. Um, and um, when I started working with the Enneagram, um, I was studying with Don Riso and Russ Hudson back then, who I know Maria Jose, you studied with as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, great teachers. I learned an incredible amount. Um, the thing that I struggled with is taking the Enneagram into organizations based on um, what I had learned. Um, and so that became the nature of my work. How do I work with the Enneagram? How do I teach the Enneagram in a way that is friendly for the organizational environment. But beyond that, it's not just about organizations. It's about what is a pragmatic approach to this? How do we simplify it? How do we, um, how do we make it clear so that people can understand it, so that people can remember things, so that they don't have to remember a million different things. But uh, what I wanted to do was establish a set of first principles that we could then um, uh, expand from in our understanding of different personality styles. My clients who are mostly corporate executives don't have the luxury of becoming Enneagram experts or the interest in being Enneagram experts. But um, uh, so I wanted to give them a way to understand the Enneagram that they could remember, that could give them the amount of information they needed to then um, infer different insights. Okay? So uh, let's look at the next piece. So this is an Enneagram, okay, like we talked about. Okay. Now, the Enneagram, uh, typically a system of nine, um, 
and that is what we call the strategies. And we're going to talk about those strategies in a minute. But uh, we really see the Enneagram as two models, a model of three instinctual biases, which other people call either instincts or subtypes, and, uh, and then the nine strategies. Uh, in fact, when we teach the Enneagram to our corporate clients, we teach the three instinctual biases first, uh, which is something that um, uh, evolved over time. That wasn't always the way. Um, Rio Jose, you were always a big advocate of teaching the instinctual biases first. Um, why don't you talk about why we find that to be useful? Yeah, um, so I am. And in fact, when I don't have a lot of time with clients, I find it really useful to talk just about the instinctual biases. And the reason is um, that, first of all, the it's just three. It's a lot easier for people to um, classify themselves into three categories rather than nine. The other thing is that it's just easy for them to see themselves in one of these cat categories. And if they don't do that themselves, other people can very quickly see them as a preserver or navigator or transmitter, one of these three biases. So, and the third reason is that many times um, what people miss, it's the insights about these three instinctual biases when trying to type themselves or type other people. Um, having these done first, then it's just easier to see, okay, so if I'm a preserver, uh, what, what's my strategy or what's my type? And it just makes it easier to uh, assess my own or other person's type once I know what my dominant instinctual bias is. Uh, many times the main um, mistypings happen because we are not clear on the dominant instinctual bias. So it's clear to type or to assess type, just easy, and it provides a lot of insights and things to work with for teams and leaders and people in general. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that we have found over the years since we started focusing on the instinctual biases is that um, in our view, the instinctual biases actually have a, um, a bigger impact on organizational dynamics than the nine strategies do, mm -hmm. right? Um, and a lot of the programs we do actually look at how these three instinctual biases um, affect organizations. Uh, a lot of the programs that we're going to hear over these five days are just focused on the instinctual biases, right? And so um, in our view, uh, not only is it uh, helpful in helping people understand themselves, which is absolutely critical, but it really explains a lot about organizational dynamics. And again, as people will see as they, as they go through these sessions. Okay. All right. Um, I'll, I'll just make one final point on this. Uh, Maria, Maria, yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. So um, there are people who say that uh, we shouldn't teach the instinctual biases out of the context yeah. of the nine strategies. I completely disagree with that. Um, I find that the three instinctual biases work really well as a standalone typology. Uh, like you said, Maria Jose, if you only have a certain amount of time, we teach the instinctual biases. Now, obviously, uh, this is not going to be as complete or as robust as if you're talking about all 27 subtypes, but as anybody who works in organizations know, uh, you usually have fairly limited time with clients, and so you have to find ways to give them information that fits the time um, constraints that they have, and the three instinctual biases is a great way to start with that. So a couple of things about the Enneagram that are important. Um, you know, first of all, it is a descriptive model. We are identifying different kinds of people, so to speak, right? Um, and it offers prescriptions. This is the key thing. It's not just about describing something, but it's about helping people change, okay? helping people grow. Uh, again, a theme that's gonna come through these uh, sessions over this week that um, if all you're doing is learning about yourself and reflecting on yourself and thinking about yourself, uh, then you're wasting this tool, right? This is a tool to help you understand yourself so you can grow. And the beauty of the Enneagram is that it does provide nine or really 27 um, uh, ways of improving. 
okay, or ways that people can improve. And the things we want to use it for are working on ourselves, right? How can I become better? And then how can I understand the people that I work with? There's always a lot of fears that people are going to use the Enneagram to manipulate other people to try to change them. Uh, I always tell people I've been in the people changing business for 22 years now. And the thing I learned is that people don't change that much. And in order to change, they have to want to do it. Uh, I have really not found a way to use the Enneagram to manipulate people to make them become something they're not or anything like that. Uh, if there was, I'd charge a lot more money for it for my work. All right. Good. Anything? Yeah, I would add. I, I would add that what it's not. It's um, uh, how do you call it? Uh, so it's descriptive and prescriptive, but it it doesn't tell you what yeah, it's it, going to happen. Yeah, it's not predictive. Right? Yeah, it's, it's not predictive. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and and we kind of know that, but some people act like if they knew what a four would do or a seven would do, and yeah. and the moment you think you know, then you're lost. We are complex human beings, and uh, we can kind of anticipate with some degree of probability what somebody might do, but we just don't know. And and I think this is an important. Uh, point in our approach that it's we're very careful about how we describe the strategies and the instinctual biases by saying that they might do this or could do that um, and not uh, state it as if it's always like that. Yeah, 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 absolutely right. We use qualifiers all the time, may, often, that sort of thing. Good. Yeah. What it all comes down to for me when it comes to these strategies is whether we use the strategy skillfully or not. What I mean by that, uh, you know, as we'll see in a moment, um, each of these points represents a strategy. Okay? Maria Jose's strategy is what we call striving to feel perfect. Mine is striving to feel powerful. Now, there's no benefit or demerit in being one of those other rather than the other. Um, they both have strengths, they both have areas of vulnerability, so things that they can uh, learn from and grow. Um, there's no point in my view in trying to shed ourselves of our type, of trying to reject our Enneagram type, or even in my view to try to tame it. I think that's you know, language that's counterproductive. For me, the question we have to ask over and over and over again, Am I acting in adaptive ways here, meaning that I am increasing my effectiveness and my happiness and the happiness of the people around me, or am I using them ineffectively or maladaptively in a way that's causing me to suffer, or the people around me to suffer? Okay, so all wor our work when it comes to the strategies is all about how do we help people use their fundamental strategy in a more skillful, more effective way, and gradually through the redefining of that strategy to, um, um, to become more flexible, to have more options behaviorally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. An important thing for us too is that the Enneagram is a problem resolution protocol. A problem resolution protocol is what is used when you have a problem. Okay, so if you have problem with your internet connection, you call your internet provider and you say, I am having this problem or that problem. And the first thing they almost always do is say, reboot your system. Okay, why do they do that? Uh, they do that as a first step because they know that that will fix most of the problems. Okay, and if it does not, they go on to the next step. They will ask you, okay, you rebooted your system. Now, what do you see? And you tell them, okay, here's what's happening now. And then they say, okay, now try this. So they're basically reading from a protocol. It's probably not written. It's probably on their computer screen, I would imagine. But they are walking you through a process. And they do this because it saves time. They know that very often rebooting your com computer or rebooting your router will fix the problem. And they don't have to spend a lot of time asking you a lot of questions when there's probably a simple answer. For us, the Enneagram is the same. If something in our life is not working, the Enneagram says, hey, look at this. Okay, for me, it says, hey, look at point eight. 
look at this strategy of striving to feel out. I'm sorry, striving to feel powerful. Um, and maybe you're misusing that strategy and that's a starting point. Now, just like with rebooting your router, it doesn't always fix the problem, but often it does. If it doesn't fix the problem, you go to the next thing. And again, our work with the Enneagram helps to provide a chain of what are those next things, but this is the important thing. It also brings up a point that um, Tamar uh, made in one of our trainings that was, I thought, really insightful, kind of obvious, but really insightful. And that he said, you know, if there's no problem, don't use the protocol. Right. So for us, the Enneagram is not something that we should wear as a uniform. Right. It's not something we should carry around with us all the time and always be thinking about the Enneagram. It's something we use when something is not working in life or when we're trying to improve something, fix some sort of problem. That's when we you know, kind of reach into our bag of tricks and take out the Enneagram. So this is a fundamental idea of the awareness to action approach. Yeah. And I think this is when people hear about it, it's kind of a relief because it's kind of, I'm a two, so what should I do? Nothing, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know? So do you have any problem that you can solve by using the insights that this model provides? So it's, it's not like there's anything wrong with them. It's a tool that we can use to resolve the problems that we have. Yeah, yeah. And, and this isn't to say it can't be used as a developmental tool, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, some of us, you know, want to continue to work on ourselves when we don't really have any problems and that's fine, right? Uh, uh, but the point is the Enneagram is a tool to be used um, when we need it rather than just, you know, all the time. I always get frustrated when I see, um, the, you know, uh, Enneagram clothing and that sort of thing with their type on it or you know there's a saying in Zen that Zen is like soap right when you when you're dirty you, you know you get in the shower you, you get yourself wet and you use the soap to, to wash the dirt off but then you rinse the soap off and you go on with your life you don't walk around covered with soap uh, the Zen Buddhist would say you don't walk around covered be covered being covered with Zen either and we would suggest you don't walk around being covered with the Enneagram All right, so why is the awareness to action Enneagram different? Okay, this is what we'll do, or what are the components of it first, I guess. Okay. So this model has three descriptive elements and three prescriptive elements, meaning that there are three elements of the model that describe people, and then there are three elements that say, okay, here's what you do once you know your type. Uh, now, this, this latter part was one of my frustrations when I first was exposed to the Enneagram, um, which is back in 1994. Um, the, you know, great as far as describing uh, people, but I really didn't know how to apply it. I didn't know what I was supposed to do with it once I had the information, right? Um, and so that became something that I really wanted to address when uh, Robert Talon and I wrote uh, uh, Awareness to Action. Uh, what do we do with it? Okay, so um, the three descriptive elements are the instinctual biases that we've talked about already, the nine strategies that we've also referred to, then we have the core qualities, which we will get to uh, a little bit later, and then the prescriptive elements of the awareness to action process, the nine accelerators, which are practices uh, correlated to each point of the diagram, and then we have 12 leadership competencies. Now we call these leadership competencies because again, we tend to work with leaders. Um, but in reality, these are life skill competencies. Okay? These are um, just things to do to be more effective people. And uh, th this again is a theme that you're gonna see as we talk about the awareness to action process. Uh, I'm doing a session uh, during uh, this summit on mindfulness and uh, with, with Tamar and for me, mindfulness and these understanding ourselves and these descriptions are just the first step. Right? Uh, I'm, I'm very influenced by Buddhism, and you know, mindfulness is one of the central uh, practices of Buddhism. But it's not an end in itself. Okay, our goal is not just to be mindful. Our goal is not just to be present. The reason that we want to be mindful and present is so that we can act effectively so we can practice what the buddhists would call skillful means 
Okay. So uh, the reason we call the company awareness to action is because action should follow awareness. Now, when we're talking about action, we're not just talking about, you know, um, you know, being more effective at work, that sort of thing. It may be um, working on your emotional intelligence. Okay? It may be working on your personal relationships, your parenting skills, whatever it is. It may be uh, resolving some of your own uh, inner demons. Okay? But um, the point is, is that we need to do something with this material. Yeah, something that um, I truly like about the way in which the whole approach it's laid out is that we can, um, if we have an hour with a client, we have something that we can share with them that will be useful. Let it be kind of the three instinctual biases, an overview of it, or uh, just an overview of the nine types or strategies. But we don't, I, I remember that before at the, or at the beginning, people would say, how much time do you need uh, with the team to do something with the Enneagram? And I would say, well, at least two days. And well, we don't have two days. And uh, some people do. And with some people I work for five days. But if you don't, you meet the client with where they are. And um, we usually, even in trainings, five day trainings, we start with that basic layer and then we go deeper and deeper and deeper so that the content are kind of just sinking in and you start internalizing it um, in layers and not very deep into one type and very deep into the other type, but kind of going um, deeper and deeper as you need to go. Uh, and this is something that it's possible because we have uh, structured it in a way that we can do it. Yeah, that, that's that's a really important point, um, Ria Jose. And this is not to suggest that we only have you know ninety minutes of material right to present to clients. Right? I mean, we do a we do a three week certification program, so there's lots of material here, uh, but we draw a distinction between our corporate clients and what they're looking for and then trainers that we train, right? Um, you know, trainers need to know everything. The client doesn't need to know everything the trainer knows or the coach knows or the consultant knows. Okay. So, um, uh, you know, so absolutely, right. We start with where they are and what they need um, and then have the, the ability to go deeper should we need to. Yeah. So the descriptive elements are all about building awareness, okay? And um, awareness has a lot of different uh, uh, aspects to it, a lot of different meanings. And, um, uh, and it all starts with that. Again, the company, the book were called Awareness to Action. Um, and so it starts with awareness. So we start with these three descriptive elements, the instinctual biases, the strategies, and the core qualities. And we'll go through those um, uh, one by one. Uh, the key thing to understand about the instinctual biases is that this, uh, these three different biases or uh, instinctual domains are areas of attention or values. What we mean by that is that each of us uh, pays more attention to one of these particular domains. And the reason we pay more attention to it is because we place a higher value on it than others, right? And uh, you'll see in the way that we describe uh, these, uh, what we mean by that. But, uh, you know, the reality is that our attention goes to what we think is important and it doesn't go to those things that we don't think are important. So the three instinctual biases speak to our most fundamental values, those things we intuitively believe are important and pay attention to. Uh, now, why do we do that? A lot of arguments could be made on that. I think that these things are fairly hardwired in to us uh, by nature. I think these are the legacy of uh, uh, millions of years of evolution uh, leading up to our current uh, set of circumstances, our current set of psychological phenomena. But um, um, doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is, is that we each have a tendency to focus on one area over the other two. This doesn't mean that we don't pay attention to all three of these domains, it just means that we do so differentially. Yeah, and 
there's nothing wrong with it. I think that uh, what you were saying about uh, uh, a legacy of evolution, understanding human nature in general and going kind of studying and looking into uh, what biology or psychology have to tell us, it's fundamental for us for in understanding um, human nature and understanding that these are natural things. It's probably good that we each focus on a different uh, domain in this way. And by understanding that, we make people feel that there's nothing wrong with it. And so people are more open to uh, listening to these things. When we kind of demonize these things and say, oh, you shouldn't be like that, and you shouldn't be like this, uh, people don't want to hear about it. And it's natural. But when we talk about it, uh, and show them how it's normal that they focus more on one domain than the other, and that has good things and bad things, um, people relax and are more willing to work on the things that are not working. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, critically important there, uh, Maria Jose, about not demonizing any of these things, right? And not making them seem bad. Um, a related frustration that I have with these is when people say, oh, you should try to be equal in all three of these domains, that you should try to you know, have your instincts kind of balanced like three legs of a stool. Um, the reality is, is that there's no social species that doesn't show differential um, expression of traits, meaning some are good at this and others are good at that, right? And humans are certainly that way. All of us have our own gifts. All of us have our own areas of attention, uh, our own areas of interest, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. In fact, um, I think it makes life better. In organizations, uh, people don't expect their salespeople to be just as good at finance as their finance people. And they don't expect their finance people to be just as good as engineering as their engineers. Uh, they understand that the group works better. Everybody's happier. Everybody gets a chance to thrive when they have the opportunity to focus on what they do best and what they enjoy the most. Okay. And so our view on this is, you know, you're going to have probably strengths in areas of interest here, uh, in areas that you're more drawn to, and you should leverage those strengths. All we have to do is make sure that we don't have weaknesses in another area that's causing us real problems, okay? Even a salesperson in an organization has to have some understanding of finance, okay? They benefit if they have some understanding of engineering because it makes them more effective at what they do but they don't have to be experts in it. And we take the same approach when it comes to these three instinctual biases. You don't have to be experts and you will never have equal legs on that stool, okay? So my view is always, you know what? If my stool is a little crooked, I'm gonna fold up a piece of paper and stick it under one of the legs because that's good enough for now, okay? Yeah, and this applies not only to the instinctual biases, but the strategies and everything we do. And it doesn't mean that we are reinforcing the ego or anything like that, which I've heard. Uh, I think it's just being pragmatic. It's again, meeting the client or meeting ourselves where we are and acknowledging the strengths of that and working on the weaknesses, making us uh, more flexible and functional in the world. And um, I like that approach. So what are these three instinctual biases? Um, common names for these are self-preservation, social, and sexual, or one-to-one. -one. Um, I really struggled with those names for a while um, uh, for a couple of reasons. Okay, so first of all, uh, one of the big, I think, misunderstandings about human nature is this idea that we have three, and only three, instincts. Okay. Um, instincts is really not a word that's used in biology that much these days because, first of all, no one agrees on what it means, and um, uh, human nature is more complicated than that. We don't have three instincts. What we have are three domains of evolutionary adaptations, meaning impulses that group together in a particular way um, uh, and shape our behavior. So, uh, you know, for example, we don't have a self-preservation instinct necessarily. We have a mechanism that tells us to eat when we're hungry. 
right? We have a mechanism that tells us get out of the way of danger, right? We have all these different mechanisms or modules or functions in the brain um, that ultimately serve self-preservation, but the category is bigger than that, which is one of the reasons that I changed the names, okay? So after I sort of abandoned this idea that there were only three instinctual or three instincts, I started saying, okay, but what's really happening in these areas, right? Because one of the things I noticed is that the preserving uh, or the so-called self-preservation behaviors were not all just about preserving the self, okay? It expands beyond that. It expands, you know, beyond, you know, into just preserving things in general, right? Whether they be artifacts, whether they be traditions, whether they be or the well-being of, um, you know, our offspring, the people we care about, okay? Uh, with social, uh, I really wrestled with that because uh, social tends to imply uh, extroversion, uh, that, you know, somebody likes to talk to people and likes to interact with people. And any person of this subtype will tell you that's not necessarily the case. That's not what motivates them, okay? What this domain is really all about is understanding the group and the dynamics of the group, okay? How can I navigate my way through these uh, these group politics. Okay. Now, with the uh, sexual subtype, um, uh, first of all, the, the one to one, as some people call it, is really problematic behavior for me. And I came across so many people who misclassified uh, themselves or mistyped themselves because of misunderstanding what uh, you know, or, or because of their interpretation of what one to one means. Um, what I actually find is that it's the preservers who are more focused on that one-to-one -one relationship in terms of security and safety and consistency and sort of long-term one-to-one relationships. Um, as far as the word sexual, first of all, um, it's only part of it, right? The, you know, sex is a very specific act, right? I mean, there's, there's a definition to it, okay? Um, and uh, what's happening here goes beyond that. So the, um, the word sexual only captures a piece of what's happening here. And quite frankly, it's not terminology that you can use in organizations. So that's just an added reason to, to uh, abandon that name from my perspective. What's really happening here is a system of behaviors that allow me to transmit, right? That let me get attention from people uh, that I want attention from and then transmit something to them, whether it's my genes, whether it's my artifacts, whether it's, um, you know, um, something, of my, my ideas, right? Something that I value, okay? So uh, the three domains are preserving, navigating, and transmitting. Each of us does all three of them, okay? We all do them in a, you know, a different pattern. There's nobody who does not do any preserving. There's nobody who doesn't do any navigating, uh, but, we do them to varying degrees. Okay. Maria Jose, why don't you talk about this slide? <laughs> I'm going to throw you to the wolves here. Go ahead. Oh, sure. So as Mario was saying, uh, preserving is about nesting and nurturing. So how do we tend to nest and nurture ourselves and other people? And what we have here is three categories where that we use to um, sh show all these mechanisms that Mari was talking about. So one of them is around security and how we want to be safe and be careful and avoid risk and things like that. The other one is uh, well-being and resources. So we have, we pay attention to our own and other people's well-being uh, and also about the, um, the resources that we have, how much do I have, for how long will that last, which doesn't mean that we want to have a lot. Uh, it means that I know how much I have. I'm sensing how um, my well-being is, how I'm feeling. It's more attuned to these things rather than how those things manifest. And then maintenance, it's kind of maintaining the nest and fixing things and could be gardening or adding things to the nest. Uh, so it's different ways in which preser the preserving uh, instinctual bias can manifest. And the way 
I go about it, the way in which I satisfy these needs or these values, it has more to do with my um, strategy, my preferred strategy. So for example, both Mario and I um, are uh, navigators. It's not preservers in this way, but for a, nav for a preserving one, it would be more about um, perfect preserving and for a preserving aid could be kind of powerful preserving. So it's different ways in which, in which this shows, but the focus of attention is in this, these three um, categories. This important point to make is that um, um, just because we have a bias in one of these areas does not mean we're going to be skillful in it. There is a difference between skillfulness and valuing something, right? Most of the people that we work with are pretty skillful people. Uh, they're leaders in organizations and they wouldn't have gotten there if they're not skillful. So they tend to be skillful if they're a preserving one or a preserving three. They tend to be pretty good at the things related to the preserving domain. Um, but, um, uh, but not everybody necessarily is, okay? Um, so also people will express these um, through the lens of their um, um, strategy and it will look different. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, uh, there's going to be a lot more talk about these instinctual biases through the session, so we don't have to go into detail about these uh, like we are here. So stay tuned, uh, and other uh, presenters will get more into this. Um, so navigating is about orienting to the group, trust and reciprocity, power and influence dynamics, and identity and status are all issues related to that. Okay, the transmitting domain, go to that slide, please. All right, so this is about attracting and bonding. How can I get your attention so that I can pass something along to you so we can connect? It's about asserting oneself. It's about going after what we want. It's about broadcasting and narrow casting. I send out broad messages and then I narrow down on people who seem to be interested in what I have to say. And it's about leaving an impression. Okay. Now, again, we're just kind of going through these at a very high level. Each of those ca these three categories break down into three subdomains uh, of those uh, into more detail. Okay, but we, this is an overview, so we don't have time for that now. All right. All right. So if the instinctual biases are what we want, what's important to us, the nine strategies are how we go about getting there. Uh, like Maria Jose said a moment ago, uh, she and I are both navigators, right? So we have, we value the same things, we pay attention to the same things, but we do it in dramatically different ways. Maria Jose is a one who's striving to feel perfect and I'm an eight who's striving to feel powerful. Uh, so it's almost diametrically opposed ways of going after the same kind of thing many of the times, right? Um, all right, so let's look at these nine. Okay, yeah, so here's a good point. Important uh, thing to point out when it comes to these strategies. So a strategy is a thematic approach to solving problems, okay? Businesses have strategies, uh, you know, teams have strategies in sports. It's what is, a, what is the way we're going to go about this in a coherent way? Our view is that the, these strategies are rooted in the desire to feel a certain way, okay? And that influences the way we think and that influences what we do. So when I get up in the morning, I don't think to myself, oh, okay, I have to strive to feel powerful today. It's just kind of a regulating feeling for me. When I feel powerful, everything feels okay. So I'm gonna think in ways that make me feel more powerful and I'm gonna act in ways that make me feel more powerful. Right? So it's not a conscious strategy. It's a non-conscious strategy rooted in a feeling that we're trying to capture. Yeah, and I think this is a very important um, part of how we approach the Enneagram. It's not just um, a list of characteristics or traits of a type, but this is kind of the logic of each um, style. It's, it starts with this feeling need, and that's kind of the kind of label that we use, so striving to feel perfect in my case. Uh, that leads to a particular kind of thinking or filters of reality and then a particular kind of actions, which could be different from other ones, other type one, but uh, there's a logic to it that once I understand it, I kind of 
see where the other person is coming from and why I do what I do. Uh, it goes to the, kind of the, the core of my worldview, when we put it this way. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, just, a, just a quick note here. Um, uh, we're covering a lot of ground quickly. You can go to the next slide, Maria Jose. Um, um, please visit our website, um, awarenessaction.com, for more resources on this, right? Some, um, some written resources. Uh, we also have a lot of videos at enneagramvideos.com that are free, um, and uh, books that we've written at awareness to action books.com. Okay. For further resources on these things. Okay. Uh, so the nine strategies striving to feel now, uh, we're, again, we're not going to get into depth on these, um, but, uh, I, I think I'd like to point out how they're, you know, some of these words are a little bit different than we might see from some other people. Okay. So, um, again, it's, it's a, a striving to feel. Okay. I want to feel a certain way. Um, I think everybody kind of agrees that point one is about striving to feel perfect in some way. Uh, we did a training a while ago where somebody said to us, it's not about being perfect. It's about being beyond reproach, right? Which, okay. You know, I, I, I don't really get the difference, but you know, it's, you know, okay. I, I can, I can buy that. Okay. But the idea is I don't want to be criticized. Yeah. I don't want anybody to be able to point to some flaw in me, uh, which, you know, I just call striving to feel perfect. Uh, point two, striving to feel connected. Now, the, um, a lot of people talk about the two being a helper. And in our experience, not every two is a helper, uh, but every two does want to connect to people. Now, helping other people is a great way to connect to them. So you do see a lot of helping behavior. Uh, one of the problems I see is that uh, because of that you know, idea of helpfulness being so emphasized here, a lot of people who see themselves as good, helpful people misidentify themselves as two, right? Twos. Um, so it's, it's a commonly, uh, it's a common mistyping for people. Uh, but for us, again, it's about connection. Uh, point three, striving to feel outstanding. Okay, again. Please. Okay. All right. You oh, you won't. All right. Let's uh, be sure everybody's muted here, please. Thank you. Um, so um, uh, point three, striving to feel outstanding, right? I want to be accomplished and uh, uh, achieve things. It's all right. There. All right. Uh, point four is about striving to feel unique. A lot of people think, you know, oh, fours are all artists or, you know, creative people. And that's just not our experience. What motivates a four is this desire to be different in some way, to feel different in some way, to find their own unique identity. Sometimes creativity is one way of doing that. Art is one way of doing that, but there are other ways as well. Um, there are athletes uh, who, <laughs> there are, Sorry. you tell me to hurry up here, Maria Jose. I'm getting... No, 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 it's not a hidden message. It's, all right, all right. Uh, okay, so the, uh, um, there are athletes who are fours, there are business people who are fours, uh, you know, but they all are striving to feel unique. Type five. Oh, there's, so, sorry about that. Yeah, I just ahead. want to mention this. And they're successful people. And yeah. that's something that really bothers me. I've seen so much bad press about fours uh, not being able to be good leaders and things like that. I think yeah. they can be great leaders. Um, Absolutely. Anybody else. Yes. And, and that applies for every type. Absolutely. And can be very successful as well. Uh, point five, striving to feel detached. Uh, cerebral and analytical. Okay, again, people think that it's all about investigating. It's about knowledge, collecting knowledge, that sort of thing. Not necessarily. Okay. Um, yes, we often see that in fives, but what is really driving them is the desire to keep some emotional buffer between themselves and the world. Uh, point uh, six, striving to feel secure. A lot of talk about loyalty with the six. Yeah, sure. But um, the, the, the reason for that loyalty when we do see it in sixes is because it helps them feel secure. Right? If I'm a loyal member of the team, I'll be protected. Uh, point seven, striving to feel excited. Um, again, we want to be careful about assuming that all sevens are happy all the time or that all sevens are optimistic. I always tell people I live with three sevens. If you want to see a quick... Um, you know, rebuttal to the idea that sevens are happy all the time, come to my house, okay? Uh, yes, sure, they're happy a lot of the time, but it's about stimulation, it's about excitement, okay? Um, point 
eight is striving to feel powerful. Uh, again, that's pretty standard. And as is point nine, striving to feel peaceful. Okay. Now, when we put these nine strategies and the three instinctual biases together, we get 27 subtypes, right? So I love this image about putting the pieces of the puzzle together, okay? Um, and again, for us, the um, three, um, uh, the three um, uh, instinctual biases work as a separate typology as do the nine strategies but together you get a system of 27 which is where you really start to understand it okay uh, let's go to the next one please Maria Jose. okay so the subtype is the strat the intersection of the instinctual bias and the strategy go ahead so what that looks like uh, again we want to focus on uh, simple easy to use terminology when we say that somebody is preserving, our clients can kind of figure out what that means. When we say they're transmitting, yeah, they get that. Okay. Same thing with the strategies. If we say somebody's striving to feel perfect, we can figure out what that means. And the same with striving to feel peaceful, striving to feel powerful. When it comes to the subtypes, even though there's a lot to say on each of these 27 subtypes, at the highest level, right, that starting point of the spiral, we talk about perfect preserving perfect navigating, perfect transmitting as the three subtypes of the one. All three of them use the strategy of striving to feel perfect, but they use it to satisfy different instinctual needs. So fundamentally, you have somebody whose main motivation is to perfect their environment, right? The preserving domain. Uh, then you have a group of people whose main motivation is to perfectly navigate, to interact socially, in a perfect way or a way that's beyond approach. And then you get perfect transmitting, which is about sharing their view of perfection with other people. Okay, so very often people who are, like I always think of Old Testament prophets, right? Who have opinions about how things should be when it comes to the transmitting type one. Yeah, and, and when we see it this way, um, it's easier not to mistype people or not to, fall into the stereotypes of the type because it's, for example, with the type one, everybody in their minds, they have this person who has everything kind of tidy and perfect in their environment. But um, a navigating one would focus more on um, having perfect interactions rather than a perfect environment, which is not what we usually read in the books, but uh, that's what um, this is, showing us and that's my experience as well so it's it's just easier to not fall into these um uh simple stereotyped uh descriptions of the types yeah also um a quick point i'll make here is that very often the instinctual bias looks like a type it looks like a strategy mm -hmm. right so a lot of preservers look like ones i see a lot of preservers mistyped as ones or uh, sixes. Uh, sixes right um i see a lot of navigators mistyped as nines or threes a lot of transmitters as sevens or eights or maybe twos um, because these two things can look a lot like each other so it's important to understand what happens when these two mix together, right? Um, if you have somebody who says they're uh, a preserving one, but they're not fairly meticulous in their environment, they're not a preserving one, okay? It's just, you know, the, the, the way it tends to be. They, they may be preserving something else thinking that they're a one. All right, All right let's move on, please. All right. So the third descriptive element is what we call the core qualities, okay? And this is where we go a bit deeper. Okay? And again, it reinforces this idea we talked about earlier about how uh, we don't teach the clients everything, okay? And the core qualities is certainly one of those things that we typically don't really share with our clients, even though we're aware of it, okay? So just like a good therapist does not share all their knowledge about psychology with their clients. This is one of those things that we only really explain when we need to, okay? So these are deeper qualities of human nature. Now, this is where, in our view, the Enneagram goes from being a model of nine kinds of people to being a model of nine um, aspects 
of each one of us, right? What we mean by that is that all nine core qualities really apply to all of us, but we feel the stunting most acutely in one of them, okay? Which is why we identify as a particular type. Should we, uh, there we go, all right. So uh, when it comes to the core qualities, something that I, I wanna make a point of is that when we are born, these qualities exist in us in an immature form. I don't like the term essence. The term essence has this view that these things are fully formed in us. Um, they're not, okay? They're things that just like everything else in life needs to mature. So the way to think about these core qualities is that they go from being kind of like an acorn to um, being a uh, to an oak tree with the proper nurturing, with the proper development. Okay, so um, uh, uh, that's part of the work that we need to do. Okay, comment, Riose? No, I no. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. So there was just a question here about whether we'll be sharing the slides. Okay. Uh, let's be sure we make those available. Uh, Maria Jose, okay. we will send an email out to everyone, letting them know how they can get the slides from this presentation and others yeah. um, after the session. Okay. All right, let's move on. So the non-core qualities are objectivity at point one. Okay, and the way I like to describe this, and I'll, I'll keep this brief, um, think of a baby in uh, you know, just being born and the qualities they have. So they have these qualities in an immature form. Immature objectivity is, um, uh, you know, I, I don't have prejudices and preconceptions. I'm not really objective yet. I haven't developed that ability to step back from my emotions and my, uh, and, and to, to think uh, objectively, but I don't have prejudices yet. Compassion. Children have compassion when they're born when they're in the maternity ward, if one baby starts to cry, they all start to cry because they pick up the other person's feelings and emotions. And, uh, um, uh, and um, uh, so, but I'm sorry, I got distracted there. So we pick up these feelings and emotions, but again, it's in an immature, non-managed way. Value, every person has inherent value independent of accomplishment. Individuality. Everybody's unique. Everybody's got their own fingerprint or footprint. Uh, intuition. We don't consciously think about things, but we follow our internal impulses. Confidence. I don't have fears and anxieties yet about the way the world is. Joy, which is uh, happiness, good feeling, independent of sensation. And then uh, vitality, which is natural energy and benevolence, which is goodwill, good intention towards other. Now, the challenge with all these core qualities is that they become stunted in our childhood, okay? They, just like the, uh, the, the sapling that doesn't quite grow into the oak tree, um, they, uh, they can be, become stunted. And our goal in the work is to help the maturation of these nine core qualities. Okay. Anything you'd add to that, Maria Jose? Yeah, just to reinforce the fact that um, it, it requires work and we will see how to, how we do that later on in the next kind of uh, with the accelerators, which is one of the, um, other, the prescriptive elements of the model. But uh, you can't just pull kind of a little tree uh, so that it grows. We need to water it and work with it and um but these are really deep elements that we resonate with and my experience with clients is that and with myself is that you feel like you're doing very deep almost spiritual work and we don't talk about spirituality uh, a lot uh, some people think, and because we're talking about what our approach is and isn't, some people say that we're not spiritual, we're just for business, and I have to disagree. It's, we do very spiritual work, we just don't talk about it. We do it, and this is uh, a piece that uh, goes right into that. 
I think on Wednesday we're doing a session uh, with Viva on um, yeah. spirituality that will be very interesting. All right, let's move on to the next part. Um, so now we're getting into the prescriptive elements. And uh, so the awareness to action process is the first thing. Uh, this is going to come up a bit more in the session later today on coaching. And uh, in the session that I'm doing on mindfulness later this week, we'll be talking a lot about that. Uh, so I don't want to spend uh, much time on the awareness to action process here, but it's really just about rewriting our narratives. Okay, so it goes through three steps. The awareness step, which is paying attention, which is understanding our habitual patterns and then setting a goal for change. But then realizing that whenever people try to change, they run into resistance and this resistance is internal and this resistance is also rooted on in some um, historical definition of what their strategy is. Okay. So they see, for example, in my case, um, um, uh, striving to feel powerful in a very limited way. If I want to change my behaviors, I have to redefine that strategy. Now this is again, a key difference from where we are and some other people are, our view is, is that you have to work with the strategy. You have to continue to redefine the strategy, but to still stay within the boundaries. If you tell an eight, don't worry about being powerful, they're, you know, they're just going to ignore you at best. Okay? Uh, they're probably going to be more vocal than that. Um, if you tell a one, don't worry about being perfect, you're just asking them to do something they can't do. What we can do with our clients is help them redefine what it means to be perfect or to be powerful so that they can change the behavior and get some freedom from that definition. And then finally, it's about creating an action plan. Okay. Uh, if you don't have an action plan, you're wasting your time as far as I'm concerned. Okay. What is it you're going to do? How are you going to anchor these learnings? Anything on that? Yeah. yeah so as, as a professional coach, I would say that we tend to go from awareness to action, keeping the authenticity piece, which it's, um, kind of ignoring the resistance that you were mentioning before. And by resolving these conflicting commitments, is to, to just kind of unlock the desire to change. You want, people go from knowing that they have to change to wanting to change. And that gives them um, more flexibility. And it feels more authentic. That's what, how, why it's called authenticity. So the accelerators, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, the accelerators are practices that speed up our growth, okay? That speed up the, the nurturing of these core qualities. I know this one makes you dizzy, so we can move on to the next slide here, right? So um, these are practices related to each point on the Enneagram. Again, I want to... Um, point out, like I said before, that when we're talking about the core qualities and also with the accelerators, we are talking about the Enneagram as a model of individuals, okay, nine aspects of the individual rather than nine types. So all nine of these accelerators benefit all of us, okay, each one of us can grow from uh, working on these. Um, it helps to start at the one related to your point and the connecting points. Uh, but any one of them can be useful. Point one, it's acceptance. It's about recognizing that the world is as it is. And if we want to make a change in it, we have to let go of our anger or frustration about circumstances. Acceptance is not the same as abdication. It's not the same as resignation. doesn't mean we can't work to change things. It means that we need to do so um, unemotionally and um, uh, calmly in order to do it rather than through a position of anger. Uh, just one quick point, since we're getting towards the uh, end of our session here. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat room. We will save uh, a few minutes for questions if any come up um, in the meantime. Uh, point two is empathy. Okay, practicing empathy. Now, we make a distinction between emotional empathy and cognitive empathy, which is actually testing our empathic feelings about other people. Uh, two seem to be very empathic, but very often they're projecting their own needs or their assuming needs of other people as a way to connect to them rather than really empathically reacting to them. Point three is about purpose um, related to value. Okay, We find that with threes and with each of us, creating a purpose statement to help give us some kind of structure for our activities, some kind of 
um, meaning uh, is very useful. Point four, individuation. Fours have this tendency to uh, always be comparing themselves to other people in their striving to feel unique. Uh, this is all about letting go of those comparisons. Point five is intentional practice. Remember the core quality here was intuition. A lot of people think they can just trust their belly or trust their intuition on areas in which they have no expertise. Uh, that is potentially catastrophic. Okay, I may have intuitions about how to fly an airplane, uh, but don't trust my intuitions because I've never flown an airplane. Right uh, now, if if Sully has intuitions about how to fly an airplane, you trust him, right? Or if some famous pilot does, but uh, with me, you know because I don't have experience there. My intuition is immature intuition, like a child's. It's not mature intuition trained through intentional practice. Point six, how do we get more confidence? Through evidence, through recognizing our accomplishments and activity that we have sixes do, uh, as well as threes and nines, and sometimes the other types is write down a list of all your accomplishments. Okay? Write down the things that you've done well, so you can have some grounded sense of confidence. Point seven is enjoyment. Taking a moment to smell the roses, taking a moment to be present. Okay? Uh, that's the process of bringing joy into something. What sevens are doing instead is striving to feel excited, to kind of um, you know, jump from one thing to another, like the grasshopper. Uh, this is all about settling down. Okay? Point eight, we have self-discipline, developing some practice that channels the energy. Uh, it's very important for eights because eights are very often like a fire hose with nobody holding on to it, right? Makes a big mess, gets everything wet, and is often ineffective uh, in the, the focus. So self-discipline is like putting hands on the fire hose to direct the energy of the eight. Finally, generativity, which is all about helping other people grow without some desired benefit to ourselves. Um, really important for nines to do for them to start feeling their uh, inherent benevolence. Okay. Comments on that, Maria Jose? Um, it's, this is a life path kind of work, and, uh, yeah. but um, very useful once you understand how each of these accelerators helps nurture and grow the core quality. So encourage all of the listeners to uh, look more into this. Yeah, yeah, good. All right, so finally we have the, um, the 12 leadership competencies. Um, so again, we work with leaders um, and these competencies are rooted in a competency model that we've created over the years um, uh, that we have attributed to the Enneagram. Um, although, you know, when I, when I first started working on this, I didn't want it to be some sort of typical, well, at point one, the leader needs to do this, and at point two, they need to do that, etc. cetera. Um, I started making a list of what I continually discussed with my clients and what I found to be important leadership attributes. Now, there is no ideal list of leadership attributes or competencies. Every leadership situation is different. Different situations require different skills, but this is a set of competencies that we have found to be highly useful. Can we go to the next slide, Maria Jose? Okay. Um, so the first nine of them um, uh, relate to the nine points. We talked about the awareness to action process, awareness, authenticity, and action. Um, those are points three, six, and nine. Um, now, while there's a point where there's a competency at each one, there's a relationship to each of these, okay? So um, the awareness to action process that we identified is awareness, authenticity, action. This is what we call self-mastery, right? Becoming skillful people, right? Whether we're leaders or not. How do we change behavior? How do we grow um, is uh, correlated to this um, triangle. Next one. So leadership thinking, uh, this should actually say, this is the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this is leadership yeah. relationships. Okay? Yes. So a uh, little, little uh, 
mistake there. So this is about how leaders relate to other people. And so this is the 852 triangle. Even though on the Enneagram, there's no real, uh, where Did are we I going? Stop sharing? Saying, you stopped sharing, yes. I need to fix it. No, okay, well, do it quickly, please. Um, so uh, <laughs> this is the beauty of working with a one here. So um, the, uh, the, um, um, the way we think of this is kind of envision an open-ended triangle. And at the top, when it comes to relationships, is power. Every leadership relationship is about power, and leaders need to know how to use power. But they also have to balance that with uh, detachment and connection. So usually when we teach this, we have an arrow uh, pointing from uh, two to five and five to two, and a double-headed arrow talking about the dynamic tension between these two things, how people who are um, uh, leaders need to be both connected to others and maintain uh, emotional detachment at the same time. Leaders can't be uh, good leaders if they're too connected to people and can't make hard decisions. Parents can't be good parents if they can't say no to their children. So this dynamic is really important in all of our relationships around setting boundaries, but particularly for leaders. Then we have leadership thinking. Okay, this is the 174 triangle. Again, uh, another way to think about this is the one at the top of the, of the um, triangle. Uh, creativity and curiosity sort of rooted in a, um, a dynamic tension with each other. Uh, now, by rigor, we mean good critical thinking skills, good solid protocols for decision making uh, that we apply in the right amount at the right times. Uh, creativity and curiosity have to be in a dynamic tension with each other. We have to be curious to find new things out. The best leaders are curious people. But once we know things, we have to be able to innovate. We have to be able to think of how can I use this to create something new. So for leadership thinking, uh, curiosity and creativity are in attention with each other. Both have to be there. And then finally, uh, we call the scalable leader. And these are things that correlate to the three instinctual biases. Okay? Um, the other nine competencies were related to the, um, uh, um, the, the, the nine strategies or the nine Enneagram points. These relate to preserving. The preserving domain in this sense is all about processes and structures. Good leaders have good processes. They, uh, they manage their time well. They execute well. They have systems in place to ensure that the trains run on time. Okay, so process and structure relates to the uh, preserving domain. In the navigating domain, we talk about developing talent and nurturing relationships. Okay, the best leaders are talent developers. They know that they will be successful when they have good, strong people around them. Um, that there's, um, uh, you know, that there's a pipeline of talented people in the organization. Again, if we relate this to the current life, I'm a parent of four boys. Maria Jose is a parent of two girls. Um, it's up to us to help develop, develop talent in our children, right? And this is not to, you know, teach them to, to, you know, to go on television shows or anything like that, but help them to become skillful people in life, okay? Uh, also nurturing relationships, those relationships we have, staying in touch with people. This is something navigators are pretty good at, right? Uh, you know, uh, maintaining relationships. When we get into the transmitting domain, as far as the scaling competency, um, uh, and, and let me just say, the reason we call it a scaling competency is because they're things that help people take on more responsibility. Okay, they grew out of a conversation I had with a leader uh, on how to help people take on more responsibility. So the third domain here is be noticeable, right? If, um, um, if people don't know what you're capable of, you'll never get a chance to show them how capable you are. So each one of us needs to ensure that the people who, are, who need to see what we're capable of are able to see it, okay? So this has to do with appropriate self-promotion. And then finally, it's the quality of building your network. Even though we always think of the so-called social subtype as the one who's good at networking, 
uh, in our experience, transmitters tend to be really good at transactional networking. I need to meet somebody, I'm gonna go out and do it. They're not shy about uh, going out and connecting to people that they don't know most of the time, okay? Um, so that's the qualities there. Anything on that, Maria Jose? Yeah, that, um, I think these, uh, just as the other nine are not type specific, here they are not kind of, uh, it, it doesn't mean that preservers will create processes and structures well. They're not necessarily skillful, but they tend to pay more attention to it. So it's, it's three competencies that uh, we always work with uh, people when, after you've kind of fixed what uh, it's not working in the current role, how can you, how you can grow by paying attention to these three things and working on what's required at that specific time in order for, to take on more responsibilities. So it's usually something that I do kind of in the second part of my coaching engagement uh, with people who have high potential and want to take on more uh, responsibilities within the role or in other roles. Good. Yeah. Good. All right. So we have just done a whirlwind uh, uh, 77 minute uh, introduction to a three hour, I'm sorry, a three week training. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, what we wanted to do was give a sense of the scope of this approach to the Enneagram, and we've pretty much covered it here. Now, what we will see in subsequent sessions are people who are taking some of these ideas, some of these components, and applying it in very specific ways, okay? So some of the other sessions will get into much more detail about elements of um, um, that, that we've talked about here today. Uh, our goal here was just to kind of set it up and... Uh, uh, introduce the whole methodology. Okay, so it's a lot of content. Now, um, uh, if you want to learn more, in more detail about uh, the awareness to action approach, uh, we are doing our certification program online now um, due to current events and, and obvious reasons. Uh, we start the next one next week, module one. So if you're interested, uh, you can register at awarenesstoaction.com or shoot us an email at info at awarenesstoaction.com. We still have a few seats left, so we'd love to see you there if you're interested. Um, and uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions about what we covered today.